Once, there were no comic books. And then, sometime later, there were comic books. So what happened? This guy. Well, we don't know who invented music or writing or most other forms of art. We actually know who invented the comic book. So who was he? How did he come up with the idea for comics? And why did he spend most of his life ashamed of his work? We're gonna take a look at the first comic book ever published. And I think you're gonna be surprised at how entertaining it is. But first, let's meet the man behind it. Rudolf Topfer didn't set out to invent comics. He didn't set out to be an innovator at all. In fact, what he wanted was kind of the opposite. He wanted acceptance from the very traditional circles of the art elite. In the early 1800s in Geneva, that meant being a painter. To understand Rodolf, I think it's helpful to understand Rodolf's father. Daddy Topfer was born to a poor tailor's family, but had climbed to the upper classes of society by becoming a successful painter. Young Rodolf was expected to follow in his father's footsteps. He was raised pretty much from birth to continue his father's progress and gain critical acclaim for the Topfer name. So at age 20, young Topfer was sent from Geneva to Paris, which was the center of the artistic universe, to study at the same schools where his father had. Everything was on track for Topfer to exceed his father's accomplishments, but then it all falls apart. Rudolf's eyes eyesight begins to deteriorate. While we don't know today what caused it, we do know that it got bad enough that he had to drop out of school and return to Geneva. His hopes and his father's hopes of him excelling in the art world were crushed. So as a backup plan, Topfer starts writing novels and art criticism, but that's not going to pay the bills, so he ends up opening a boarding school for young boys. And it's actually here, at the boarding school, where his most interesting artistic innovation will take place. Though he hadn't painted in a few years, to amuse the boys in his class, he dusted off those old artistic skills and would do little doodles for them. Now, the dominant mode of art at this time was all about realism, using a nuanced understanding of light, perspective, and color to try and capture reality in a canvas or on a print. But Topfer's limited vision prevented him from doing that. His little doodles would never be approved in the high halls of Paris, but in a boarding school for an audience of boys, they were perfect. So he begins telling little stories with these characters, dividing each page into panels and adding descriptions and dialogue to each of these images so the characters he drew would seem to come to life and go on little adventures. Now, I'm not a historian, and even I know there are many examples of sequential storytelling prior to this point, but Topfer's main stated inspiration was William Hogarth. Hogarth lived almost 100 years before Topfer and was known for his sequential paintings. You could argue that these were the first comic books, but they were displayed in galleries and they were packed with details which would encourage the viewer to linger and observe each painting before moving on to the next one. Topfer's drawings, by contrast, were simple. His limited eyesight led him to add just the necessary details to each panel, allowing the reader's eye to travel quickly and bring the drawings to life. But innovative as he may have been, he had no intention of publishing these stories. Caricature, which would have been the closest thing to this new art form, was popular, but it was not critically well respected. One of the leading intellectuals of the time, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, had called caricature artists the greatest destroyers of art, taste, and morals. Even Topfer's father, when he occasionally indulged in caricature, would keep that work private, only showing it to friends and family for fear of being labeled as a caricaturist and not a serious artist. So Topfer kept his comics hidden, only giving them out to students or a few friends. Like, literally, he was just handing out his original drawings, and so he drew these little guards reminding grubby students to keep their hands clean and turn the pages by the edges, which I do too whenever I lend a comic to someone. And it's shocking, because this story could have ended there, and none of us would know that in a tiny Swiss boarding school, a new medium had been invented. But luckily for us, fate intervenes. A friend visiting Topfer sees the comics lying out on his desk. He flips through and is amused and asks if he can borrow some, because he has an elderly friend who is depressed about the French Revolution and needs some cheering up. Reluctantly, Topfer agrees, and his friend brings two of the books back to his friend, who immediately lights up and loves the drawings. And the name of that sad elderly friend? Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the leading intellectual of the time, the famous hater of caricature. Goethe reads them and keeps repeating, this is really too crazy. And I just find it funny, this 80-year-old intellectual titan just cracking up at the world's first comic that's filled with pratfalls and fart jokes. And it's ironic because the very thing that Topfer had been keeping private, that he made without any critical ambitions, just to amuse himself, his friends, and his students, had finally flung open the doors to the critical acceptance he'd been craving so badly. And with Goethe's encouragement, Topfer decides to overcome his fear of ridicule and finally publish his work. But first, he has to get them into print. But because of his vision, that's also gonna be a challenge for Topfer. You see, the popular printing method at that time was engraving, in which an image would be carved into a block of wood or other surface, which then is ink applied to it and is pressed onto paper. There's some really beautiful detailed images created with this method, but Topfer wasn't gonna be able to carve detailed images into wood. And on top of that, because engraving reverses the image, to include text in an illustration meant hiring someone who's trained in writing backwards. But Topfer gets a brilliant idea. He would use autograph lithography. 
You see, Topfer's invention of comics is not only artistic, but also technological. Like everything Topfer was doing, lithography was not a respected form of printing. It was cheap and dirty and used for printing grocer's bills and advertisements. But with lithography, the artist would draw directly on a chemically prepared stone or metal surface, which would then be transferred to an intermediate surface, which was then used for printing. Because of that, the image was reversed twice, so it would look exactly as the artist had drawn it on the original surface, so there was no need for fancy backwards writing, so Topfer could incorporate his words directly directly into his images. The main downside of this process is that it's much harder to retain that coveted detail. Lines would get messed up and you couldn't do the complicated hatching and shading that was so common for engraving. But for Topfer, that doesn't matter because his art was all about spontaneity, looseness, this sense of energy. I mean, take a look at Topfer's original version compared with the later version that had been recreated through engraving and you can see how lively his work is even if it lacks the technical precision of the engraved version. So now with printing figured out, Topfer's first comic is off to the presses. So how will the public and critics receive it? Good question, and we'll get to that. But first, let's actually take a look at the first comic book ever published. This is a Histoire de Monsieur Jabot. Sorry about that French speakers and for everything I'm about to do. Monsieur Jabot is a social climber who dresses in an outdated fashion and is generally kind of ridiculous. He always strives to do what is proper, whether that's eating an ice, standing in a proper way, or talking about politics. He attends a dance which gets progressively more ridiculous as he tries to fit in, discussing hunting or humoring a confused lady, and avoiding his cousin who is not at his social level. He leads the dance, but ruins it by farting and then tripping, knocking everyone over like dominoes. And I just want to pause and appreciate how sophisticated this silly gag is. Topfer already has a grasp of how to create motion in print. In the first panel, we see the dancers begin to trip, and in the second panel, the first few dancers have completely fallen over, but the back ones are still tipping over. It's a very clever way to give that domino effect only using two panels. This is a level of visual sophistication that would still be missing for many comics 100 years later, and honestly still a lot today. And already we can see Topfer playing with the contrast of words and images, where his cousin finally finds him and takes this opportunity to embrace him. It goes on like this for a while, and Jabot ends the night with multiple duels to fight the next day because of all the people he's offended. But I want to jump forward to a later sequence because it just goes full zany. So Jabot is checking out how nice his legs look when a candle lights him on fire. He starts complaining about the warmth and the flame, and his neighbor, a widow, overhears and thinks he's talking about the flame she has lit in his heart. He starts shouting, fire, fire! and she's moved by what a serious passion she's ignited in him. But then his fire ignites his gun, which causes the widow to faint, believing he has killed himself because of his unrequited love for her. Her dog faints too. She recovers to hear Jabot cry out, this could have been the end of me, which she finds very touching. They both go to sleep, but the smoke causes her to sneeze, which causes Jabot's dogs to drag him into her room. When he awakens, he still thinks he's in his room and he goes to get dressed, but he gets tangled up in her underpants. She awakes and sees him, but thinks he's a burglar and cries out for help. The innkeeper runs to help her, but Jabot entangles himself just in time to see him and, assuming he's the burglar that the widow was shouting about, tosses him out the window. And it's so interesting that this wacky story satirizing social climbers is made by a guy who has so much anxiety about his own social status. Because once the printing is done, he gets cold feet again. See, he's applied for a job at a prestigious university and he's worried that if the comic comes out, he won't get the job. So he waits and waits, distributing it only to friends and family until he's got his job locked down. So finally, in 1835, he releases the book to the public. But there's a problem. In the intervening year, years, Goethe had died. Goethe would have been the one person who could have given the book the approval it needed to gain critical acceptance, but he wasn't there when Topfer needed him. So when the book comes out, just as Topfer had feared, the critics tear him apart. And it's crazy to think that these critics had an entirely new medium in front of them and didn't even realize it. But the public did. His book, this new format, it's a huge hit. It sells out so fast that a whole cottage industry of piracy pops up, of publishers copying and printing it, making illegal translations, as well as a whole market of unofficial sequels. This wasn't even illegal because copyright laws didn't exist. But for Todd for himself, his feelings are mixed. In letters to his friends, he confides disappointment at the lack of critical acceptance, but he can't help being excited by the popular praise, not to mention all the money it's bringing in. So he continues releasing comic books, lithographing the stories that he'd originally written in his boarding school, as well as writing new ones but he releases them anonymously and he writes these self-deprecating essays putting his work down and it's so sad to me that because of the critics he felt ashamed of this incredible work he was creating. But at the same time, there's this urgency to his work, as if he's racing his diminishing eyesight to publish as much as he possibly can. He even enlists the help of the very people who'd been knocking off his work to engrave some of his stories. But after releasing seven books, his eyesight becomes too bad for him to continue working. But he isn't finished. 
because he does something that brings this whole story full circle. He writes a critical evaluation of the art form he created. That's right, since no one else is going to treat comics as a serious art form, he decides to do it himself. And in these essays, gone is the self-loathing and the inner turmoil. He praises the art of doodling, the simplicity of comic drawings, and he encourages everyone, even if they don't have a natural skill in drawing, to try telling stories in comics. He celebrates the unfinished, imperfect drawing because it invites the reader to use their imagination to complete it, just as the reader has to use their imagination to bring the space between the panels to life. It's something he saw children understand intuitively that his critics had failed to grasp. It seems that finally, shortly before his death, he accepted that his limited eyesight wasn't a weakness, but a gift. That critical praise wasn't all that mattered. That art could be fun and funny. He died knowing that he had done something important and valuable, even if his critics couldn't see it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you can really help out by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Finally, big shout out to David Kunzel, who, at least in the English speaking world, has been relentless in keeping Topfer's works in the public eye. And I'll put a link down below to this big translated edition of all of Topfer's works that he produced. It still reads really well and is pretty funny. And if you're into this kind of thing, I suggest you check it out. Thanks so much.